next presenter is uh, Max Lendowski from the University of Lübeck. And he will present today a learning and remote teacher for our license and supervisor study this summer. Okay, then, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes? Does it work? <laughs> okay, it's better. So, today I'm going to present you our work about learning interpretable multimodal features for alignment with supervised iterative descent. And basically, what we are trying to do is to. <laughs> Somehow, this doesn't work. <laughs> So no, it works. Great. Um, what you can see here is um, an example for multimodal image registration. On the right, you have a moving MRI image. And what is happening in the middle is that we iteratively, iteratively transformed the moving image to the fixed CT image so that finally corresponding structures like the liver and the kidney are aligned. Um, and the clinical motivation, of course, is obviously that you want to allow clinicians to benefit from the combined advantages of modalities. Um, for example, you have the high image resolutions of CT images and the better soft tissue definition of MRI images. Um, the challenging thing about multimodal, Im multimodal image registration is that you somehow have to define the similarity measure between these images and that has to be invariant to be robust, for example, to the presence or the absence of contrast medium. Um, to field inhomogeneities as they are common in MRI imaging and of course to multimodal input. Um, to give you a more formal problem definition of the process of image registration itself, basically what you're trying to do is minimizing an energy equation that is commonly um, built up by two terms. The first one is the similarity measure that measures how good the fixed and the moving image align in some sense, and the second one penalizes your found transformation by its plausibility. For example, in medical imaging, you don't want to have folding in your fields because this is obviously not plausible for human tissue, for example. Um, and on the next few slides, I will give you a short overview on the related work that we mainly group by two categories. And the first one is how these methods assess the similarity of images. And the second one is the optimization strategy that they use, if they just use one path or if they have a lot of iterations to get the final transformation between the moving and the fixed image. So why is this problem so hard to solve in the first place? Not only for multimodal images, but also for monomodal images, you can observe that there are problems like differing intensity distributions between scans, and these are, for example, caused by the um, biological variance between different patients, for example, and this is why most of the time simple metrics like the sum of squared difference is not applicable. And you could ask yourself, aren't there any statistical solutions to this problem? Well, of course they are, and people came up, for example, with the local normalized cross correlation as a distance measure to handle these varying contrasts in the monomodal case. Um, the multimodal case, however, is a bit more complicated, and you can, for example, look at this small, yeah, at this small example. On the left-hand side, you have a fixed image with um, basically three intensity values that are monotonically decreasing from A over B to C. And on the right-hand side, you have the moving image where actually the intensity values are just flipped. So before you can register these two images, you have to find an intensity adaption that is here now a linear relation. Um, in this case, your standard metrics like the SSD or the NCC would work. However, when you just alter this example a little bit and you have the intensity of E no longer being in the middle of the sequence between D and F, you have a nonlinear relationship that emerges and this would bring your multimodal registration based on cross-correlation to fail, for example. So in the past, people came up with, for example, um, the mutual information that was basically introduced as uh, information theoretic 
um, inside to the field of medical imaging, and here you minimize the entropy of a joint intensity histogram, and then you are able, for example, to register these two slices of a brain image that was acquired with different MRI protocols. Um, yeah, since this conference states in its, in its name that we are somehow interested in learning, we come or we face a problem that we cannot use standard backpropagation algorithms so easy when we try to backpropagate through such a joint histogram because you have to handle additional hyperparameters uh, when you have to discretize the number of bins that you are using in this histogram and when you are actually using um, multi-channel features, your space for this histogram will pretty fast explode, so you have also to think about how can I populate this histogram and you have to decide whether you, or which kind of kernel, for example, you use and how big this kernel size has to be. So what we did was we tried not to look at the metric anymore. We tried to use a simple similarity measure like the SSD again and get some inspiration from um, approaches that first are trying to get some common representations for the input images. And in the field of computer vision, you had the local set similarities from Schechtmann and Girani. And Heinrich et al., they introduced the so-called mind descriptor to the field of medical imaging. And with this descriptor, you were able to robustly register CT and MRI images that were firstly transformed to a common space where such structures like the borders or the homogeneous areas um, now have a common representation as patches and you are able to iteratively align those images. Of course, there are deep learning based approaches, also for multimodal images. Um, you can name here the method of Hu et al. that trained a one-step dense deformation field predictor and they trained it on segmentation. So they had a loss that focused on the label. You had the multimodal image input, but the loss actually only was um, computed on the labels. And during the inference, you just pushed the input images through the network once. So you had this multimodal approach, but the idea of an iterative um, kind of registration update wasn't there anymore. And with architectures like the FlowNet um, that you can see as a, they are structurally similar to the idea that the VOS et al. had for their monomodal multi-state registration, you can see that they are using stacked networks. So the first part of their network, for example, is um, responsible for affine transformations and then up to three parts of this network are doing the iterative steps for deformable image registration and this indicates that somehow it is not as easy to find for large transformations the right deformation field in just one path through a network but you have introduced here these iterative ideas again so um, then there was also an iterative approach of Tana et al. however this approach was not trained end to end what they did was they synthesized the moving image to the modality of the target, and then they used the standard iterative approach, but as I said, it was not trained end to end, and initially you could have, for example, when your GAN wasn't trained that good, already spatial inconsistencies here, you can see them at the lung border, and therefore you start directly when you're trying to iteratively register them with an initial error that you won't compensate for during the whole process. Um, to have a short recap, we have this classical mutual information approach that uses uh, or that focuses on the similarity metric and was iteratively, as, it, as the name says. And then you have the approach of Heinrich and I, where they are also using an iterative scheme and pose the problem to find a similar representation directly after the in image input step. Um, the cyclic approach of Tana et al. is somehow similar. However, it was also um, not trained end to end. And then we had those deep learning approaches by the Fawcett al. and Hu that were trained end to end and had the common representation for their features. However, they used relatively few or only one step. And this is where we try to sort our algorithm in. And we learn end to end features <coughs> only with weak supervisions. However, they are learned and trained during an iterative registration process. So 
how does it look like? Um, basically, this is an overview of our approach. In the lower part, you see the iterative scheme. Um, and since we have to somehow learn our filters that are initially randomly um, filled, we need to be able to backpropagate some gradient information. So the lower part, there will, no be there will no learning be involved. However, we have to hold this differentiable. And how can we now try to learn our features in the first place? Where well, we use the weak supervision. This is where the weak supervision obviously comes in. Um, we have images from different modalities. And through a signed distance map transformation on the organ labels that we also have for these images, we get a shared representation that is now independent of the intensities from the modalities itself. And at first, we do one iteration on this side and get a transformation grid update step below this uh, delta u v. Um, in the meantime, we also do one step for the iteration with our networks or with our features, and then Based on our features, we update the parameters that are used as transformation parameters for both methods. And because we implemented all, this, all these things in a differentiable manner, we can now go on and try to ask for our filters what was a meaningful direction when we have this representation on the right-hand side from the signed distance map, where we assume that this kind of um, process would give you a good next step for your transformation parameters. And yeah, basically this is a difference between two tensors where you just can compute the sum of squared differences and because we implemented it differentiable, we now can backpropagate an error to the feature CNNs that we are going to train. So to sum up, we have in this step, an indirect supervision um, that tries to learn a, si a similar grid optimization step instead of just mimicking the segmentation task and using these segmentations to um, register the multimodal images. Um, how are we able to backpropagate um, the gradient signal through our framework? Um, this is where I have to give you some details on the B-spline descent module. And what's happening in this B-spline descent module is that we use a, an energy term that is inspired, well, that is demons-like. And when you assume that you have multiple iterations within your framework, you can justify to at first do a first order Taylor step. And when you minimize now for your um, update parameters, you can sort the resulting terms into a linear system of equations. And luckily, with the Sherman-Morrison formula, you can find a closed form solution per pixel. And this closed form solution per pixel only is made up from operations that are differentiable. And basically, this is the formula that is at the core of our approach. Um, the experiments that we performed was that we used the two data slices of the silver corpus from the Visual 3 challenge, and they had provided ground truth annotations, and we used six um, out of these organs for through plane motions because this is a 3D data set. We used the Deeds SSC approach by Heinrich and I to have initially a somehow comparable content in our um, slices in the cor coronal direction. Um, we did a ten-fold cross-validation experiment by differently or randomly split training and test data sets. And as a baseline experiment for, mutual, uh, for multimodal input, we use the simple elastics framework to compare against our framework. Um, at first, we did an early verification experiment where we did not involve in our framework any learning, just took monomodal CT images and registered with the B-spline descent module only on the gray values. And we were able to um, increase the initial average die scores from 44% to 69%. And for the experiments within our frameworks, we, on the one hand, used the handcrafted mind features as input, and then we were able for multimodal input to lift the results from 53% up to 66% dice average overall organs, and 
With our train feature CNNs, we could again increase the scores to 72% average overall um, structures. So some more details on the training for our features. We used, a, um, we used three stages of differently um, coarse B-spline control point grids. And per stage, we did 300 iterations to find the right um, transformation parameters. And we allowed our feature CNNs to get help for the right update direction at every fifth iteration during training. Um, the structure of the CNNs that we used is actually held rather simple. These were only seven layers, and we trained or we, we passed back the gradient signal only at active organ regions, meaning at organ borders, so that we don't have too much gradient signal from background. Um, yeah, to give you some more numerical results, luckily our method performed best out of the three compared ones. Um, closely followed by the simple elastic classical framework, um, showing that even this this robust baseline couldn't get any or couldn't get much better. Um, some results where you can visually observe that, for example, for large structures like the liver, the warped organ labelings that we transferred from the CT to the MRI images align a little bit better when you use the C CNN features compared against the um, handcrafted mine features in this example here. Um, yeah, to give you a quick look at work that is, that is currently in progress, um, instead of using the um, demons approach where you have after the first iteration a transformation field that doesn't directly resemble the ground truth and you for example, have to smooth it first to find meaningful gradients. Um, you could also use a different type of regularizer that brings in diffusion. Um, a problem with this is that the closed form solution per pixel um, isn't available anymore. However, you can try to implement, for example, a conjugate gradient solver. And if you do this also with just back propagatable steps, then you can use the same framework that we um, proposed. So to sum up, we presented a new approach to integrate CNN-based multimodal features into a classical iterative image registration pipeline with only weak supervision by organ labels during the training. And yeah, for future work, we would like to explore some more CNN architectures or the influence on the CNN architecture itself. And of course, we will use 3D volume data. So thank you for your attention and um, yeah. See the little recruitment activity. Hi, um, I wonder if you could give me a little bit more detail as to why you'd want to actually have an iterative um, process, comparing to like who tells work, who um, has a one step model. Um, actually, yeah, we, we scanned somehow the literature for approaches that have already been proposed and we noticed that somehow there is this trend to these stacked networks where you have this idea of more iterations and yeah, we have seen that there are no learnable um, approaches so far where you have this yeah, multi-iteration process and try to learn features for this kind of approach, yes. Yeah. Um, so your yeah. <laughs> uh, in your title you say you learn interp interpretable features. Yeah. What exactly do you mean by interpretable? Um, by interpretable, you can see some exemplary results, and I could have added them into the presentation. But um, these are the features that you could expect after. Um, the feature CNNs. So, yeah, basically, what you can see here are some um, gradient filters at um, yeah, the borders of certain structures. Hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice talk. Um, a few years back, uh, there was a paper in Mikai that was not dealing about registration, but it was dealing about multimodal synthesis. Okay. And it assumed um, non-registered inputs 
where each input is mapped to a multi-channel representation at the same size of the image, and then the registration is done there with a spatial transformer layer. So the, in, the features are directly interpretable, uh, and the registration is done as a byproduct mm -hmm. for synthesis. I was wondering if you can comment uh, the pros and cons between your approach and Samsung approach, if it any. Yeah, uh, well, that's a good question. I think I would have to think about it a little bit longer, so we can, I would enjoy to discuss this. Yeah. But right now I'm. <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm here. Uh, great talk. Um, yeah, so I have a follow-up question regarding the learned features. Uh, have you tried applying your technique on uh, different organs? Like, are these features applicable to different, um, let's say, like brain images and other stuff? Um, so far, we just did it on the abdominal images. Um, I think an experiment that we definitely ha would have to do is leave some organs out and then evaluate um, how good the dice score for the left out organ that we didn't have during training is. Um, yeah, so of course we would have to do this on brain images and other images too. Yeah, that would be also interesting to see. Are there other questions? No? no. Maybe I can add one. So. Um, all of your experiments were on 2D data. Are there going to be any particular challenges associated with extending this to 3D? Um, except from the memory restrictions, um, so far not now. Is that going to be a significant limitation, do you think, from the memory restrictions? Uh, yeah, when you are trying to do this with these um, 3D scans, you would Maybe you would need to do some, side, uh, some, some sort of multi-resolution strategy where you can train on some low sample data to have to grasp the, the global contrast and you would still need some fine resolution data to have the better information at the organ borders. So I think that for such an approach where you just would do this directly for big volumes, you would need to find some strategies how you process your input data. Okay. Is your code publicly available? Uh, we are planning to do this, yeah. So it will be coming soon. There is a GitHub link uh, below the paper, and yeah, within the next two weeks, I think, we will publish this code, yeah. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again.